Hi, I'm Marcel, and I'm a shell, and sometimes I use people's toenails to ski on. Welcome to The Culture Edit, your weekly roundup of all things work and culture. Hosted by Nikki and Chad Strickland, co-founders of Niche Culture, a strategic consultancy and creative agency, helping some of the world's top brands define, articulate, and promote their culture to their employees and the world. All right, Saturday, uh, episode six. I almost forgot what episode it was. It feels like, because we're interviewing people when we can. We're trying to book as many interviews as possible, so then it... But then we're having to go back and record uh, the openings to the interviews after the fact. So it's all getting a little bit jumbled together. Uh, But episode six, really exciting considering most podcasts, 80% of podcasts don't make make it past episode 10. So we're close. We're getting close. So hello, everyone. Buongiorno. There you go. You got your high. You got your... Before the podcast... Bonjour. Before the podcast, Chad was like... You need to let me, you know, say hi to the audience before you just dive into everything because I feel left out. But you still just dove right in. Why? Well, of course. I didn't even get to say bienvenidos in our international audience. I'm saying hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 13 different countries yeah. are tuning in to the Culture Edit podcast. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. All of our international listeners, we're really curious who you are. Yeah. Well, we have someone in the Ukraine listening, which then I thought maybe is... Anastasia uh, VPNing from Marietta to watch Ukraine television. What what are all the countries? So it was all right, we Belgium. Got, we got the United States of America. Yep. Germany, Mexico, Belgium, Canada, Italy, France, Denmark, Greece. I'm gonna say this wrong. And Gila. Maybe it's Angila. I don't know. United Kingdom and the Ukraine. I have an idea for most a lot of friends around the world that ride bikes. I think that's where a lot of that comes from. Definitely. I mean, Den- <laughs> Denmark, we were just in Denmark. So uh, yeah. it, I'm sure that some of our Danish friends are tuning in. So. Well, at least the Danish women are tuning in because I wasn't even allowed to go on the men's ride. So I, I doubt they're turning, tuning in. Well, no, you did go on the men's ride. You just weren't supposed to. Well, I, I wasn't. Yeah, I didn't say I didn't go. I showed up. I was not welcome. You uh, broke the <laughs> the glass ceiling on the <laughs> group ride scene in Copenhagen. I, I was actually telling that story to uh, Johnny today on the ride. I was saying how uh, when we went to Copenhagen, there was a women's ride and a men's ride from this uh, store. And so I did... Pod normal. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I wasn't going to call it out. but uh, So I did the women's ride on like whatever it was Saturday. And then the men's ride was Sunday. And... I showed up to the women's ride. Everyone's super cool. I mean, I made a bunch of friends on this ride and we were moving. Like this was like, we were like dodging like road furniture, you know, I mean, we were, these women were going hard. You said y'all went harder than we did on the men's ride. Yeah. So, yeah. so I was saying that it, what was funny is we went pretty hard. I mean, it was like a good steady pace, really strong women. And, uh, and they were like, wait, you're going to go on the men's ride. They were. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to the men's ride tomorrow. Because, I mean, we're here, we're on vacation, and Chad was going. And they're like, oh, you're going to the men's ride? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, oh, we haven't, like, only, like, one other girl does the men ri- men's ride. Like, let us know how it is. So then you did it, and then you told them it was easier, and now they all we, go to the men's the, ride. We went slower on the men's. We did the same route, and we went slower than the women's ride. Yeah. And so I kind of, you know, reported back and was like, uh, y'all are actually a lot stronger and cooler than the men. So I think I, I think that was the glass ceiling that broke and the men's ride is hopefully just a co-ed ride now. (laughs) So yeah, thanks for everyone for listening. We've been really pretty blown away uh, by the feedback, both in person and on the internets. Uh, It's got a lot of traction. You've looked into this. Uh, Yeah, we're now in the top 12% of podcasts as far as listeners go for episodes after five episodes though pretty good yeah yeah, yeah. really we good. can do better but no i mean we can do good. a lot better like yeah. we kind of we kind of suck but also stay humble one thing we don't mention subscribe and share so we need to, to we don't do that enough so we need to make sure everyone's hitting the subscribe button and sharing with your friends if you think it's entertaining so it's saturday first time we've uh spent a saturday in the studio i kind of feel like we're spiraling first we started like part of a sunday then uh, all of sunday now we're part of a saturday so basically soon we're just gonna be set full, seven days a week full time no we already <laughs> we already are <laughs> uh 
That's why whenever my mom texts me, I can't wait to retire and live my life like you. And we're literally in the office and we just laugh. But yeah, it's because it's a busy, busy, busy week and weekend while we're here. Uh, we've had a busy week already. I had to do hot laps around the office with Hutch chasing me just now so I could bring my energy levels up because I am exhausted. So yeah, so it's a busy day. Um, we did the... Woke, woke up at like 5.30 in the morning. Yeah. Did the NCL Bearings Bike Works ro community ride. Yep. With actually a lot, I mean, considering the terrible weather, a lot of people showed up and it was really awesome. So it was raining at the start. Yeah. And we still had over 50 people mm -hmm. at the ride, which was pretty shocking. We had a short loop and a long loop and most folks went long. Yeah. Uh, and it only rained for three of the three and a half hours. Yeah. I mean, so I, I got waterboarded for three hours. Yeah, because you're in the, in the group, and so the spray is going in your face the whole time, and we're covered in dirt. The, the best part was when we, and I can tell people now, but we there's a section where if you don't do this route often, you wouldn't notice it, but it's the dump for the entire city. And so when you're riding on the road, when it's dry out, you see that there is debris and disgusting stuff on the road and then today when we were riding through you the were getting road sprayed with sewage oh god and I you said alan died. alan noticed alan noticed and what yes, did he doctor, say dr mcdonald noticed it had stopped raining now. it had stopped raining but obviously the roads were wet and he goes hmm i kind of wish it would start raining again <laughs> And I just, oh, yeah, I had to put it out of my mind. That's good. So we had a great ride uh, with NCL. They had pros there. Uh, you already mentioned Johnny Clark from Australia, Sergey. Um, Gabe. Gabe and Izzy from. Yeah, Izzy Harden, Greenville. Greenville, South Carolina. Um, so really good, great. I, I do want to give a shout out to the Paceline Project. Uh, that team showed, they showed up, up in force uh, along with our team. Great guys been friends with them for 25 years now and uh, anytime we need them to show up for a ride or event they do so shout out to those guys uh and then the night well i guess it was last night paris wallace and andrea pagnanelli from the ncl they hosted a little event at nick's west side uh, which we were lucky to be invited to and that was really cool and thank them for inviting us to that you want to give a restaurant review yeah, so I, so I have to be transparent on the restaurant view. This, so Nick's West Side, never been, never been heard about it. Yeah, it was it was it was mediocre. It was mid, as you say. Yeah. Um, but what sent me, and this happened right off the bat. You were wearing a a brand new white blazer, which I don't even want to know how much it was. It wasn't that. It was, it, it was like new. on sale, but but it doesn't. <laughs> it, well, the thing is, like, even if something's on sale, but it's nice, you don't. I don't treat things differently because they're on sale. So I'm, you know, I love this new white blazer that I just got, super nice. And the server brings out my red wine where he had like poured into the glass and then like didn't do, you know, the twisting of the bottle. And so the, the wine had run down the glass. He let it sit on the counter. So it pooled at the bottom of the glass and he puts the glass down. And of at course- At the bottom of the stem. The bottom, the sorry, the, the bottom of the stem. Yeah, yeah and the so platform so right when i pick up the glass it drips all over my jacket yeah amateur hour i mean it i was uh, i i think i was nice considering but it really you were pretty you were pretty angry well i mean you went and had a conversation with them privately well yeah of course yeah there. all this was happening during dinner <laughs> um yeah so it was mediocre i'd never go there again the honestly. food was just i don't know it, it it was fine it just wasn't anything special yeah uh, you know what it will be special and why we're in here on a Saturday is because tomorrow we're going to Del Bar with our friends. So other restaurant news, huge news we're super excited about. Yepa and Co. Yepa and Co. I don't know why Yepa and the word Yepa makes me really like Yepa. Well, I think that's the idea is like, it's like exciting. So this is part of the Forza group, which is one of our favorite restaurants. Uh, Forza Storico. I forget. The Forza Storico. Storico Fresca. Storizo. Or Fresco, maybe. So the question we were just talking about, they're going to go into the junction. Shout out to Scott DeMeyer. Right below our office. Basically yeah. underneath our office. So right by our office. Uh, the question we have, and I think you were talking to Sam about this, is is it possible for a restaurant group that's actually fun and successful to avoid the Beltline curse? Yeah. 
The Beltline is a curse, and Sam agreed with me. Anything that comes to the Beltline, if it was good at another point in time and place, it just somehow, I think they can't hire on the Beltline. I don't know what it is, because you would think they'd make more money being on the Beltline, but it's cursed. What happens? It just turns lame. So feedback from last week's episode with Andrea was super positive. Yeah, really, really positive feedback. I think it... I, I mean, there was just a lot of question, unanswered questions that she was able to answer in a very eloquently, way, eloquent way. I had a lot of people ask me if we heard from Velo. Um, no, we have not heard from Velo. They are not looking to advertise with us yet. Um, <laughs> but it's funny that that caught people's attention because we didn't even feel like we were that brutal. What we want to say was it could have gone on much further. I mean, we did say they're not journalists. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's kind of offensive if you're in the media, but it's true. <laughs> it's your job. <laughs> yeah, if it's you you're not good job. at your job. Sorry. Um, but you didn't even talk about your favorite subject, though, which is associated with that article, performative feminism. Yeah, I mean, I think this is such a, well, this is a big subject. You want to um, save it for another episode? I think we, yeah, I think we should save it because it, it is a thing, not just in journalism and media, but I am so burnt out on performative feminism, and I'm a feminist. So Monday, we're going to see Barbie. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, I don't know if I'm excited, but we'll You're see. excited. I mean, we're going to IPIC, and IPIC is fun because you have like you get drinks and all the... If you haven't been to IPIC in Midtown, it's so much better than all the other movie theaters. Um, Nikki will only go to a movie theater that provides full service wine. Throughout the entire movie. <laughs> Throughout, they interrupt you to ask you if you want another cocktail. Yeah, I need that. Yeah. Like, I don't like the ones where you go and they're like, you've got 10 minutes to order your last drink before the next three hour movie. Anyways, I pick full service throughout the whole thing. Um, but going to see Barbie. And, and, and so Chad and I were talking about this earlier, how amazing of a job. And we're not sure, it, it, like, it's the movie studio, whoever. They've clearly... Well, every influencer that I follow on TikTok and Instagram has done some sort of Barbie-related post or video, whatnot, in tribute to the Barbie movie. So I think that, it's everywhere. that was coordinated, obviously. Yeah. But what's interesting is that because trends on TikTok are so pushed out to the masses now, restaurants and hotels and all these places have started coming up with Barbie, Bar Barbie and Oppenheimer-themed nights and dinners and days and parties and all of these different things yeah i mean i'm wondering if there's some type of grassroots marketing strategy at play here it just feels i don't know it just feels crazy that this would all be so organic that every, and, and i don't I, I wonder like is it just because it's we're in the city world yeah, yeah. Rich, rich he's got a thing going by the way he's running for president do you see that <laughs> i haven't seen that yet. you have to see the video where he's running for president that's amazing he calls it the, i'd vote for him the party party um the party we party. should ask richard like so they're having a girl girl diver his restaurant is having a barbie themed party mm -hmm. but then like the the place at the claremont like it like everywhere I want to go. Wild Leap. So I'm just wondering, like, is it organic or is there some type of grassroots marketing campaign going on? It would just be like so much money to do that, though. But So off of all the personal stuff, as interesting as that all may be, what's going on with the culture edit this week? So this week, a couple of, I think, important things for people to look at. One, a uh, friend of the pod, Kevin Maxey, celebrity chef, uh, sent me an article it was written by David Chang, uh, another celebrity chef that I guess they used to work together. Uh, and it's about the culture of the kitchen. It's something that Kevin and I talk about a lot. Uh, and it kind of aligns with the bear, too. Uh, and one of the things that we talk about is the ever-changing or shifting, I think, focus of high-end restaurants to be more people-friendly. And so David Chang writes this really cool article that really analogizes kitchen culture with Star Wars. So if you think about the dark side and the light side, it's really good. Uh, definitely uh, think I would check that out. And the other thing is what we're experiencing when now there's a lot of media around it is that the recession everyone was anticipating never happened. And we are half the years over and companies are all of a sudden freaking out and want to get all these initiatives done. Uh, and so we're, we're seeing that on our side. I hope everyone else is seeing that as well. Um, spending most of my week writing proposals and 
talking to clients about things that we could get done before the end of the year. I mean, I hope it's a good sign going into fall and winter because that's when people get really stressed about spending, I think. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, also, I'm a broken record. Everyone's worried about the wrong strike. UPS is going to strike. So yesterday, the president of the Teamsters had a, I guess, rally. And his quote was, we've, quote, we've legalized, strategized. Now it's time to pulverize. <laughs> <laughs> Who so wrote that? Like, did he write that or does he have a speechwriter? Definitely a speechwriter. Like, I these be guys, a speech for this especially guy. the Teamsters, like, these guys, they are so old school. They are so angry. I, I, I've been in I could be the speechwriter because I like to rhyme. Yeah. I don't have that opportunity right now. I don't now. know if you're angry enough to be a union be. speechwriter. Like, you have to be really, you have to be convinced that they're out to get you. I could be. I could get in that mindset. I need to calm down. We or we might not make it home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Talk bad about the Teamsters too much. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be it's gonna be huge. Um, so yeah, lots of good stuff going on there. Uh, and um, yeah, check out the newsletter. And and I think people have asked me about the newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter on our our website. www.nicheculture.com. I'll put it in the in the episode notes. Okay. Uh, also, one one thing before we dive into Joanna's uh, interview, I want to say thank you for everyone that has told me I have a radio voice. It has sent me into a delusionally confident, distracting spiral where I've now looked into voice acting classes, right. how I can, can become a voice. I want to do cartoon. Like you have given me the delusions that I've been waiting for so i appreciate that i mean you have always talked about being a like cartoon voice actor like, i that, want to be a car- like if there's one thing that i want to do before i die i want to be the voice of some cartoon I, I i have always since i was a little kid like marcel the seashell yes we have a connection to her like maybe you could maybe i can do yeah the todd Aben. yeah that'd be so awesome yeah at least give me like a little cameo yeah that's what i'm saying i like, could i could do it yeah put me in you watched that movie i've watched it like three times it's okay. amazing. yeah marcel the seashell the movie is amazing i don't care what age you are watch it with your family watch alone such a good movie such a good message you want to do a little imitation real quick i can't no i can't do it <laughs> you do it all the time <laughs> now you can't do it on the spot You're- hi. hi i'm marcel and i'm a shell and sometimes i use people's toenails to ski on <laughs> so marcel sounds like emmy our dog because that's the voice you use and, for Amy. And that's where I got it from. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wonder if that's going to make the cut. Okay, so we got a guest. Uh, we're really excited about this. Yeah. Okay, our guest is Joanna Durr. Uh, Joanna is uh, a partner with us at Niche. Uh, she's been a huge part of, of our business over the last few years. Uh, I've known Joanna for, I don't know, 15 plus years where um, she had helped me originally as a consultant uh, to help us in our organization. And I say us in our organization and my former company help us find our purpose. And so that's Joanna's background. She started with a strategic consultancy called Bright House, which were really the forerunners for thinking about corporate purpose. She's had uh, corporate executive roles at No Rubbermaid where she's led marketing. uh, And she's also was the vice president of culture and purpose at No Rubbermaid. Uh, Really big job there. Uh, and the best way to think about Joanna and what she does uh, now today, in addition to the work she does for us, is that she's a documentary filmmaker. Uh, she is a personal strategist and consultant for some of the most successful executives in the world. So you'll hear her talk about the folks that she talks to on a regular basis, Fortune 50 uh, CEOs. Uh, she's done a lot of work with, you'll hear her talk about fortune magazine and that's who she partnered with to do this documentary film so if you ever have wondered about executives at the very top of these really big companies who are the people that are helping them every day make the right decisions join us that person uh, and so i think for those folks out there that are curious about business uh, and that are curious about i think an alternative career path Uh, We talk, we get into that with Joanna. I think it's really interesting. This is definitely kind of a big brain conversation we're about to have. We're going to talk a lot about stakeholder capitalism, and she's going to explain what that means because that's what the film is about. But I think it's really, really interesting for both business leaders and just folks in general to understand the work that she's doing 
with these big companies around stakeholder capitalism and purpose. So enjoy. All right, Joanna, joining us from Asheville. Hello. I see that you are inside, not outside anymore. Are you like yeah. in the like the mountains, like outside of Asheville? Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah, we're like just outside of Asheville, but we can walk to the Blue Ridge Parkway from our house so we can walk to like the Mountain to Sea Trail, which parallels it for a good stretch. You ever get yeah. bo- you ever get bored there? <laughs> <laughs> Moving from yeah, Atlanta. There's not a lot to do. No food, no music, no uh, outdoor activity, crappy weather, boring people. When you go listen to live music, where is your favorite place to go? What's your typical like stomping ground? Well, my favorite place to see live music in Asheville is the Great Eagle, which actually is an indoor venue, but it's a really cool size. They get acts like kind of usually early stage in their career. And then you catch them later down the road at, when they get to kind of the orange peel or some of the other larger venues. I love the size of that because I like smaller, more intimate venues. Um, from an outdoor perspective, there's Pisca used to have great music outside, and I think they're going to start again. And then there's a new venue outdoors downtown called Rabbit Rabbit, which is a really cool spot. They get good, they get good shows, and they have really good sound. And you can hear. You ever miss Atlanta? No, there are things about <laughs> Atlanta I miss. <laughs> You're like that's going to be a hard no for everyone. <laughs> yeah, no, I really don't. I mean, I miss people, you know, and I miss access to certain things. I mean, Asheville, we, you know, we have so much more. We over-index in great restaurants and kind of cool shops and stuff like that, you know, for the size that we are. But there are still places that I really miss. I miss like the DeKalb Farmer's Market. Um, really miss the DeKalb Farmer's Market. They have the best herb selection ever and it's so cheap. And there are restaurants I miss, you know, and I miss, I lived in Virginia Highlands for like 15 years. I miss living there. That was a great neighborhood, but I don't, I would never move back. (laughs) I don't miss the traffic. I don't miss the heat. Yeah. Can I ask a really random question? Cause I was listening to your last podcast. Absolutely. Why are non-white shoes controversial in cycling? (laughs) That was the weirdest thing to me. I was why is that? I've had a few people ask me that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if there is a valid explanation other than it's just a fashion social phenomenon that has overtaken cycling in the last 10 years. Well, I, I, can, I feel like I can tell you why. Okay, go ahead. So cyclists are the most vain people on the planet. <laughs> and it makes your legs look tan. When you uh, like lube up your calves with baby oil and sunscreen and put on your white socks with your white shoes, I think it accentuates the the shiny tan. Look. No, I, I really think that's what it is. Honestly, if you look at old pictures, it wasn't the case at all. Like during the Lance era, like Lance wore black shoes and black socks. Uh, and everyone had like crazy colored shoes back then. Like I had like red shoes and like blue and red shoes. But it's just over the last, I would say, decade that it's become absolutely social um, peer pressure. You cannot have anything but white shoes and white socks. Yeah. So weird. Makes the tan. Did you look? Did you look on the Tour de France? Did you watch them? I didn't look. No, I didn't look. But it had just been in my mind because I just think that's you know. I, I remember years and years ago, you know, I'm a big basketball fan. I remember years and years ago, all of a sudden, everybody started wearing white shoes on the basketball court. And I always heard it was because it made your feet look faster. Um, so if you were being scouted, you looked faster if you were wearing white shoes. So I wondered if there was any connection there. But that is hilarious that it's pure fashion. They're, they're actually, now you say that, there. I have read... Um, some articles or research that says that white shoes and white socks stands out to motorists more. Mm-hmm. So you can see it on the road because it, it's turning over and, it, and the yeah. light like, catches yeah. your... So I think that might have something to do with it. Too. Yeah, I, maybe. I don't know that. I, I don't think people look into it that deep. I, th- I, I think it's... <laughs> our, in that. I, think, I think people are like, oh, my calves look really good. I'm going to have this nice summer tan going and I'm going to make, you know, have the white socks and the white shoes and it's going to make my, make my legs look, legs look nice. It, it's a vanity thing. And, and these are like, you, you have to, your shoes have to be like clean. 
like no one has dirty shoes, which is hard to do because you, especially right now, yeah, yeah, shoes get really yeah. dirty. So, um, yeah, love, it's a thing. I love, yeah, that's a good insight into the cycling community. And when we talk about culture, that's a nice cultural insight. It is so funny how like you never grow out of, you know, how you see like a group of teenage girls or junior high girls and they all are dressed basically the same. They've got the same haircut that you never really grow out of that. Like groups of people like cyclists, you know, <laughs> or you go to any of these outdoor groups here, There, there's just a similar, there's a uniform, right? And it's so funny that we never grow out of that. I don't know if you saw there's an article in today's Wall Street Journal about Gen X fashion, how it's never been out of style, how it's never attacked on social media, like boomers are attacked, Gen Z millennials, but it's never Gen X. And they like listed the people, it's like Keanu Reeves, Brad Pitt, Winona Ryder. And it's like all these people, what they were wearing then and then what they're wearing now, it's still cool. Just you're a Gen X or two. So I thought you could appreciate that. Yes, absolutely. I was just gonna, yeah, I love it. I was gonna say we're too small of a generation to pay attention to. You know, the boomers and the millennials have us, you know, dwarfed. Well, that's and actually so, the article is it's called The Lost Generation. And I mentioned that Nikki, she's like, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah, I didn't even know that was. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't heard that before. I haven't read the article yet. I just remember years ago when I was just starting to study the millennials, uh, when they were just really starting to enter the workforce and have, you know, dollar power, um, that boomers were 78 million and millennials i think it was like 81 million and both were about twice as big as the xers is that right is that about oh, what you're right right off right off the dome that's impressive the, um but back to your point joanna i think well i know that for a 15 year period generation so it's 65 to 80 it's the smallest generation ever of people and the wow. the two reasons they attribute it to is the introduction of birth control to our moms or women our mom's age and it was when women went into the workforce for the first time did it did it bring up gen z at all just out of curiosity because I, you know they're now just starting to really be talked about and studied and things like that and millennials are the echo boom. So you would think Gen Z would be, you know, the children of the, the Xers. And so I'm wondering if they're equally small. Well, this article is just about fashion and how terrible Gen Z's fashion mm. is, or lack of fashion, lack of clothes, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I didn't talk about that. <laughs> lack of clothing. Lack, lack of clothes. We One question we want to start asking all of our podcast interviewer interviewees is, what is your drink of choice? Oh, well, I mean, it's tequila just out of the gate, um, but margaritas, you know, generally, yes. And, and where where tequila. do I go for a great margarita in Asheville? My house. <laughs> Everyone go to Joanna's house. <laughs> what, uh, send me your address. <laughs> we'll put it in the... No, I would go to a Sovereign Remedies. There's a killer cocktail lounge. Really, really cool spot. And you can't miss on anything that they have there. Really, really good. Do you squeeze your own limes for your margaritas at home? Absolutely. I hate margarita mix. Are you a salt, not... salt or no salt? Absolutely salt. Oh, see, I don't I like can't. sweets. I love salty stuff. <laughs> I like salty stuff, but I can't do the salt on the rim. Our friend Jeff Warnicky turned us on to uh, the hand lime presser uh, like a few years ago, and it completely changed our margarita game. Yep. Game changer. Yeah. I remember when I got one of those too. It's just like, do you know the other great cocktail trip? Um, Bloody Mary's half a lemon, a whole half a lemon in your Bloody Mary will change your life. Huh. Is that going to mean I'm going to have less heartburn after I drink it? <laughs> I don't know about that because it's highly acidic, um, but it's really, really yummy. Chad gets heartburn from milk, so. <laughs> margaritas. I mean, sorry, uh, Bloody Mary's crush me. So, uh, margaritas do too. Yeah, but they're yeah. still really good, though. Yeah. So, but, why don't we talk about the film, yeah. the documentary you've been working on for, for I don't know, it feels years. like years now at this point. Tell us about it. Yeah, it has been years. It has been years. March of, um, March of 2020 was when we started it. Um, yeah, it is a documentary called right now. It's called the reimagination of the corporation for the very first time in the whole process. We are discussing a name change because that is so long. Um, 
So the documentary is about basically the role corporations play in society and how that's evolving. Um, and it really was kicked off um, because I was fun. It's something I'm really passionate about. I do what I do for a living because I care about the role of business in society and always have. Um, you know, when I was in college, when I realized um, corporations in many cases are larger and more powerful than nation states. And so the role in the world is really important. Uh, and I'm a capitalist capitalist, you know, but capitalism needs guardrails. <laughs> and as society evolves, the system that is capitalism has to evolve. And I think it was August of 2019, you know, the shift towards purpose driven stakeholder capitalism was really starting to take hold in a lot of ways, finally. And it was in response to what was going on in society, you know, that um, we have more economic inequality in this country than we ever have in history. And part of that is a function of our capitalist system right now. And that's a problem. We can't keep going that way. And the business roundtable, um, which is essentially a lobbying group, um, but it's a really powerful one. It's all the biggest companies in the United States came out with a statement that said the definition of a corporation is changing and we have to change. And it is not about shareholder primacy. It is about how do you add value to all of your stakeholder groups? And they did that around the time that there were headlines all over the place in the Wall Street Journal and The Economist about uh, capitalism at risk. Is at risk. Corporations are at risk. I was having a conversation with a production company in Atlanta, just helping them with some other unrelated things and kind of slammed my hand on a table and said, this is what we need to make a documentary about. And one of them happened to know Alan Murray, who is the CEO and former editor in chief of Fortune magazine, Fortune Media. And he said, well, let's call Alan and ask him what he thinks. And so we called Alan. And the last week that New York was open before the pandemic hit, we sat in Alan Murray's office and talked to him about the idea of interviewing a collection of CEOs, people that were leading this change, and talking to them about what this change looked like, why they were going through these changes, what the concrete actions they were taking, they are taking, look like. And we did it. I mean, I didn't believe it was going to happen for a long time, but throughout the throughout the pandemic, I went and interviewed about 20 different CEOs, talking to them about what is the purpose of a corporation? You know, what is stakeholder capitalism? What does that look like in practice? You know, how do you add value to your different stakeholders? How do you balance them? What are the trade-offs you have to make? Yeah. And, and for some of our younger listeners, can you just give us like a quick overview of what stakeholder capitalism is? Sure. The idea of stakeholder capitalism is the suggestion that stakeholders are consumers, they are employees, they are society, it is the planet, and shareholders. All of those different stakeholder groups contribute to and benefit from corporations and the capitalist system. And so how do we ensure that our capitalist system and corporations being the largest institution within that system are adding value to all of them. What's the relationship? Is it reciprocal, mutually beneficial for all of those stakeholder groups? That's essentially what stakeholder capitalism is trying to do, trying to drive toward. And, and I think it's important for those of us that aren't in this world or those folks that aren't in this world to understand that the way we're, ta we're really talking about the way organizations, companies, corporations are structured and what they deem most important when they're making decisions. And so for hundreds of years, it was established during the Industrial Revolution that this is how a corporation acts and here's what's most important to them, their shareholders. I mean, I grew up, you, we both grew up in corporate environment where our CEOs constantly said it's about shareholder value. And that was at the tail end of, of kind of where we were to now we realized it's got to be something different or corporations can be structured differently and prioritize things differently. Is that a good way of thinking about it? Yeah, I think it is. I, I definitely think it is. You know, one of the cool things that I learned in the process of putting the film together is kind of capitalism and and the structure of a corporation has evolved as societies evolved. 
right? There was a period of time in the 50s and 60s where communities and employees were actually really prioritized above shareholders. And that created a backlash in a lot of ways. That's when Milton Friedman, who was an economist at University of Chicago in the 60s and 70s, came out and said, no, the purpose of a corporation is to con- to maximize profit for the shareholder group. And that really set in motion, you know, the next generation of leadership, the one you're talking about that we grew up with. And now society is reacting again and corporations have to react again. You know, it's about their own self-enlightenment <laughs> and survival. You were really a pioneer in thinking about corporate purpose. I mean, you've been doing this long before it was cool. Uh, we had you come in, me and Andrew Freeman had you come into Aaron's a long time ago, 10 years ago, uh, to help us figure out our purpose. And you were doing it years before that. It's got to be kind of cool now to see you're not having to fight people to think about purpose anymore, right? It's unbelievable. I mean, yes, it is true. So I was really lucky um, when I, I decided I wanted to go into the, to the business world. I knew I didn't want to go into a traditional organization of any kind. And I got lucky enough to be part of a company called Bright House, which the founder just kind of gave us a lot of freedom to think and um, explore how to answer business questions from a different point of view. And early on, he started talking about purpose and let us kind of explore what does the idea mean, you know, outside of the business world and the philosophical community and in social sciences across the board, what is purpose? Uh, and how do we start to bring that into the business world? And yeah, <laughs> it was like pushing water uphill. I mean, people would look at you like you were an idiot <laughs> when you start talking about what is the purpose of your business, not to make money beyond profit. What is the purpose? What do you stand for? You know, um, So, yeah, it is gratifying. Um, It's really gratifying. And there are a lot of different kind of ideas about what that means, but I think that's good. You know, I think as long as we're talking about it, as long as we're exploring it, as long as we're authentic about it, you know, I know a lot of people talk about purpose washing and that's a thing, you know, but are we trying <laughs> that that to me is what matters when, when do you think it turned like when did you when you were doing this work start to feel like oh we're not pushing water uphill anymore the, the tide's turning it's tough to say it's easy to point to social media i think in some ways because the power structure shifted the power dynamic shifted with both employees and consumers being able to pull back the curtain and kind of expose how things were done, make different demands, hold people accountable in a new way. So I think that's part of it. I think work has become a different thing in society than it once was in the sense that there used to be, I mean, religion used to play a bigger role in people's lives. Organizations like Lions Club used to play a bigger role in people's lives. So there were things that we went to to get meaning, to feel connection. And I think more and more we recognize, you know, the millennial generation looks to their employers for that sense of meaning, for that sense of connection. And so I think that's led to some of this. You know, I think leaders listen when they're good leaders um, and I think respond and recognize there's a there's a demand for more. And, and to get the best talent, we have to explore what do we stand for and how do they contribute to that? So back to the video. That's, uh, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> so you start before the pandemic, uh, March mm-hmm. 2020 hits. Uh, I remember you told me, like, I don't know what we're going to do now. Or are we still going to do this? And then you're like, okay, we are going to do it. Uh, <laughs> you were the first person I knew of that flew on a plane uh, as soon as they opened planes back up <laughs> to start going and interviewing people, crazy. right? And so walk yep. us through what that was like. That added an extra layer of complexity. I, I mean, I think I think we even started before we had a rapid test, you know? So planes were empty and 95 masks were on every face. Everything was eight feet apart. We carried around, our crews were skeleton crews, you know, it was like three people and me, you know, which are making a, making a feature length film. It was wild. Carrying around fiberglass screens to put between people. But then once we started filming, you know, everybody took 
I took my mask off and whoever I'm interviewing took their masks off and we settled into conversation face to face, which in those days felt really, really good, you know, and really natural and exciting. Uh, but it was also wild because in each case, you know, for example, Ajay Banga was uh, CEO of MasterCard at the time. He then left to become executive chairman, which we knew he was doing. They have this gorgeous I am pay designed campus in, in New York, you know, north of the city. And it was empty. I mean, it was a security guard, his comms person, him and our crew. And it's cavernous, you know, I mean, it's just, you could, things would echo, we would echo. It was wild to see these places. I interviewed Chip Berg, who's the CEO of Levi's, and I interviewed him about a year into it. He was one of the later interviews. And we go into, the, Levi's was still closed, obviously, office is still closed. It was his first time back in the office at all. And he's walking around and there are like, you know, calendar desks or desk calendars that have like... March 14th, 2020. <laughs> and it's a year wow. later. And it was just surreal. You know, it was really surreal. But uh, also hopeful, you know, because what we were talking about is what role business can play in society at a moment when business was playing a really, really critical role in society. I interviewed Albert Burla, the CEO of Pfizer in October of 2020. Wow. The, the, the vaccine was, they were waiting for approval. Like he was trying to determine if they were going to get approval before or after the election. And he was lamenting the fact that he couldn't win either way. <laughs> right. I bet. You know, it was just it was wild. You also interviewed Mark Benioff and who were some of the other big folks that you got to talk to? During um, that period? So Mark Benioff from Salesforce, uh, Dan Shulman from PayPal, Eileen Fisher of Eileen Fisher. Did you go into those interviews starting with kind of the same premise and then opening doors as they kind of went in whatever direction that they were going into? How, how did you structure those those interviews? Yeah. So there was a fun, you know, I did my research, obviously, before I talked to everybody. Um, so I understood kind of their particular position on things like purpose and stakeholder capitalism. And then as importantly, what actions had they taken inside their company, whether it was along the lines of employee compensation or um, sustainability efforts or communicating with shareholders differently, understanding all of those different points of view. So similar structure, similar topics, but then drilling down with different people in different areas. So basically structured it in, in the context of why is this happening? Right. Why is there a change happening in business and what does it look like? What does it look like for you, for your company? Ajay, what does this look like at MasterCard? And what are your actions are you taking for your, each of the stakeholder groups? So we went through that with each um, interviewee, but really drilled down. For example, Dan Shulman at PayPal, he did, he took on a massive, he, he did this thing, a big survey inside his organization years ago to understand the financial wellness, the financial health of his employees. And he basically had a hypothesis that he would do well, right? That, that PayPal paid well, that people even working in a call center in Omaha, Nebraska could live well, live a good life. He learned he was wrong. And so he worked with his board and his people to fundamentally change the compensation structure of everyone in the organization. They changed their uh, healthcare benefits and now cover 60% of their healthcare costs of all employees. Everyone got stock options. I mean, it's just really, really big efforts that took years of work, took years of working with his board to convince them to get on board. Um, but it's different stories like that with different organizations. Um, both Chip Berg and Eileen Fisher as their companies in the clothing industry, which are, you know, terrible for the planet, talked about what they've done in sustainability. So it's different with different people, you know, but it kind of tells that story of how capitalism is, corporations are changing. What was a common thread um, whether it be a personality trait or experience. Because, you know, when we do interviews with Niche, because you've obviously been in a lot of those, uh, we kind of always are surprised by some common thread that we're hearing across the board from all employees. What would be that common thread that you heard throughout all these interviews that surprised you? This is going to sound funny or weird or lame. Cool. Humanity. I mean, they're people. 
Like, you you know what? I really mean that. Like we put CEOs, especially the Mark Benioffs of the world, a billionaire who built Salesforce, you know, we put them in this sometimes appropriately in their ivory tower, right? But when you talk to them, they're people. <laughs> you know, Ajay Banga talks about his adult age children and how they think like the generation he's hiring from and how it opens his eyes to you know, a new way of seeing things, a new way of seeing the bad behavior of corporations historically. So it's just kind of humanity. They're they're just people, yeah. you know, and that's that's what I see. I think that's important to to point out because Chad and I always talk about how the younger generation will, call, you know, you hear, oh, evil corporations. I never want to work for a big evil corporation or they have this perception. I mean, you hear it on social media of every CEO is bad and they're all taking advantage of everyone. And, and I think it's an important point to, to make that even though these people seem larger than life at their core, they genuinely want to do something good. Yeah. You know, they have complicated jobs. They really do, you know? <laughs> and when they, the one thing that I genuinely appreciated too in the process is they would sit with me for 90 minutes to two hours. You know, when, when you hear CEOs a lot, they're, they're on their talking points. Nobody stays on talking points for two hours. You know, you get in laughs. Everybody's humanity is a little bit more exposed or was, you know? And so it, we just, it was, that, that was a cool part of it. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, I mean, I, I think, the people that you were talking to wanted to be a part of that process and wanted to be part of that conversation because they are real and that they are care. Just like our client CEOs don't, wouldn't hire us if they didn't care. They're, they're, I think there, unfortunately, there's a lot of folks out there that uh, don't have the best interest in mind. And that's where you get that sentiment from the people that, that feel like every CEO, every big corporation doesn't care about its people. Uh, but, we're lucky that we get to work with the, the ones that do. And that's, that's what you were doing when you're interviewing the, these folks for the documentary. What, what was, I mean, I'm just curious, what was the most um, profound, like maybe advice or insights that you, you went into the interview and you walked out and it was one of those things where you either wrote it down immediately or it just stuck in your head. What I didn't mention about the film yet, that was kind of our creative construct that, set in because of COVID is parallel to the Renaissance. The Renaissance was born on the heels of a pandemic where two thirds of the, you know, the Black Plague, two thirds of the European population had been wiped out. There was tremendous concentration of wealth. There was also at the same time, the printing press, which was an extraordinary democratization of knowledge and power. Because of those things, we also had our first kind of group of enlightened, purpose-driven leaders in the Medici family, the bankers, right? that, that welcomed in the Greek refugees. <laughs> and they were kind of self-enlightened in their leadership or in their benevolence because they realized they couldn't survive. They created the first free market because they had to. Serfdom was not going to last any longer. Anyway, we have similar forces happening today, right? We had a pandemic. We have social media, our own version of the printing press, and we have benevolent leaders kind of for their own self-enlightened interests that are recognizing that business has to do good in the world. You know, we have to support people in addition to pockets. So in addition to all of the other executives, I went and talked to a Renaissance professor <laughs> and he talked to me about the optimism of that era was the recognition that they could shape the future, that they were building something from for 500 years from now. And how do we start asking ourselves the questions of what are we building for the future? What are we building for 500 years from now? And I think that's especially important in the context of the, you know, tragic questions we have to ask ourselves in the like pandemic related questions or climate related questions. It's like, okay, what are we building to solve our problems and to build a, a brighter future for 500 years from now? As crazy as that sounds, I just love the big thinking of it, you know, and that's what's, that's what stuck with me. And I think what some of these people are doing right now, some of these leaders I talked to and the people throughout the organizations that they're leading, maybe most importantly, is building for a future, 
You know, when I talk about zip line and delivering with drones, that's step one towards a better future. <laughs> that's cool. See, you know more about the Renaissance now than you did before. <laughs> oh, I definitely know way more about the Renaissance than I did before. It was fun. I love when history repeats itself because it immediately humbles you. It immediately makes you realize that what we're doing day to day is important but that it's been done before and we really need to focus on making like you said the future better and don't worry don't get caught up in the daily drama because we're we're all here it's happened before it's going to happen again i love that it's very cool yeah yeah so so what's happening now you've been showing the film we did our big kind of premiere screening event at nyu with their center for sustainable business and we had a really a great turnout good media and things like that and as soon as the fall rolls around we're doing a tour of the top business schools so harvard and stanford um georgetown um so we'll do screenings at those and then we're working with the distribution partner and it will ultimately end up on kind of an amazon or a netflix or something along those lines and that'll be this fall. that'll be this fall that's going to be a surreal moment when you pull up amazon or netflix and see your movie there it's so exciting the whole thing is surreal. I mean, like I, I t I've told you this chat a million times, but like I feel like Nikki, you've heard me talk. I did not believe I would be. I would be. We were well into filming, and I did not believe this was going to happen. I'm like, <laughs> come on, <I> remember. <laughs> what are we talking? About? You thought you were wasting yeah. your time. It's so. Mm -hmm. It's so cool. It's. I mean, it's such such a unique experience. Uh, last night they had a, a screening in Atlanta at uh, Atlantic Station for a movie, and Tom Cruise showed up, and apparently it was a big hit. So if you could get him to come to a screening, apparently it's a big news. <laughs> Can you imagine sitting Who in was this? Tom Cruise? He was screening his movie at Atlantic Station, and he just walked out into the crowd yeah. and started like shaking people's hands. Yeah, yeah, wild. I would have wow. probably cried, or I, I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> wow yeah maybe we'll see if i can somebody can put in a word i'm not going to be too hopeful but yeah we're doing one in emory actually i should have mentioned oh uh, we're we doing one it. in emory as well what has the response been to the screening so far remarkably positive you know it's crazy <laughs> i sit there I'm like my palms sweating every time you know just terrified um and it's really been incredibly incredibly respond or positive um and in each case um afterwards i've had professors approach me saying they'd like to do curriculum around it yeah we've had really really good response really good response i can't imagine how nervous you feel sitting down for that as the lights go out like we'll produce a four or five minute video for employees <laughs> and we're super nervous so do, is it crazy to you to take a step back and be like so this is my life i have amazing house in the mountains where i get to have this really cool lifestyle and i get to do all these really cool things for work how did this happen I am deeply, deeply grateful for life, my life. Yes, I am deeply, deeply grateful. I mean, I have been given incredible opportunities. You know, I work hard, uh, but I have been given incredible opportunities and met just so many wonderful people um, like you guys. You know, so yes, I, I, I am grateful for where I am and what I have. Oh, thanks, Joe. How do you reconcile that like it, you, your your career hasn't been on a typical kind of through line how do you is there are there certain moments that happened along the way like i can think about you know i was a lawyer right? that's all i ever wanted to be and then charlie loudermilk told me uh you'd be a much better business person than you would be a lawyer and like, I remember that moment so clearly, but giving that up was such a big deal to me, but it took me in a completely different career path. Do you have moments like that, that you like think about, like, how, how did I get here? You know, one of the, I, I think for me, the biggest sort of through lines are, and I, I mean this honestly, are, are relationships and specific relationships. I had great people around me really early on in, in a small organization and we formed really real bonds, you know, and that taught me the importance of relationships throughout my career, right? I don't build relationships to build a business relationship. I build relationships to have 
a relationship with a person, to have friends that I love doing work with. And that when I need something or they need something, be it business related or not, we're there for each other. And that benefits a career. <laughs> you know, when I learned that early through these, these deep, real relationships. It actually le- lends itself to success. You know, when you have, uh, when you bring yourself to work, honestly, when you try to listen, when you recognize that there is something to learn from everyone, everyone. Everyone has something to teach you. It doesn't matter how old or young they are. It doesn't matter how inexperienced or experienced they are. There is something to learn from everyone. <laughs> and if you pay attention and genuinely listen, that's how you, you, you develop the relationship. You learn from them and you advance yourself, you know, and that's been a huge part of my career, lasting real relationships. You know, and I, it makes me think about what we've constantly, almost every week talked about on the podcast, but this this return to work dilemma that everyone's going through. But what I'm scared of is for people that have this attitude of, I don't want to go back in the office. I don't want to deal with it. Um, and, and like the level of resistance, I think out of just pure, like, I know some of it's traffic, some of that, but a little bit of maybe laziness of, I don't want to actually have to get up and go, you know, put clothes on. How do you think that's going to impact people's ability to succeed and, and build a career in the future? I am 100% with you, Nikki. I worry for younger generations. Like I can tell you every major step in my career has involved, you know, it kind of conversations that you mentioned with Charlie, Chad. I mean, where it's somebody calls me with an opportunity, somebody points out that I can do more. And it's, it's about the time we've spent together. It's about the investment we've made in one another, you know, and it's, you don't just get opportunities from that. You really learn, right? I mean, one of my dearest mentors is a man named Jay Gould. He was my, um, he was one of my bosses at uh, my first go round at Newell Brands. And just being around him, like sitting in a room with him, sitting in meetings with him, listening to the questions he asked, he knew he was teaching me just by letting me be there. You know, what my eyes got opened up to through just exposure, just being in the room was massive. You know, and I think people right now in the resistance to coming back to work, I get it. I mean, I I quote work from home, but I would have missed an entire education. You know, I really would have not to mention the relationships of I still like to reach out and talk to Jay, even though he's retired, you know, Um, but yeah, I agree with you. I think I think the relationships and the the learning that you get from those relationships are going to be a big big loss. Yeah, I had said something on the podcast last week about how you know, and I guess it was a little controversial, but um, I said no no matter what people want the reality to be, what we see from leaders when we're working with our clients is that. If you're not in the office face to face, even if you're really productive, because we know the numbers say you can be just as productive at home, leaders will not take you as serious or give you the same opportunities to learn and grow than if you're in the office. And I had someone reach out on Instagram and say, well, I just fundamentally disagree with that and they should be working harder to give us more opportunity from home. And I was just like, yeah, that's cool. Like you're, you know, I respect your opinion and I hope your company does that, obviously. I you know, that's a perfect world that we could maybe live in one day. But it, my thing is it just, that doesn't seem like reality. I mean, it, the fact of the matter is they won't know you. Yeah. And that's what yeah. Joanna's talking about. Like exactly. you don't get a chance to build a relationship with someone if you're not there and it's not conscious decision of the leader. They just don't know you and you don't build the J gold relationship. Being active in your learning. You know, I think that's the thing that also get lost, gets lost a little bit in working from home. It's hard to have the act of learning, you know, the, the things aren't right there for you to just kind of absorb, <laughs> you know, and the curiosity gets muddled and then creativity gets a little muddled, you know, and I think being around people and having the conversations, being in the room, it, it stokes your curiosity. And I think to have a big, long 
exciting, fun career, you have to stay curious, you know, um, you have to stoke that curiosity. You have to get out of your house. <laughs> well, it's great that you say that because one of my questions that I wrote down that I really wanted to ask was what you, is there one thing that you're constantly trying to learn or improve on or educate yourself around um, that, that stands out in your mind? Honestly, right now I'm focused a lot in a different way on purpose. So I'm really trying working on a framework for over the years. I've worked with a lot of leaders, and as you guys know, on how do we are articulate, excavate with you guys purpose for an organization. In that context, I've had a lot of conversations with leaders about what the indi- what their individual purpose is, right? And it's something I've thought a lot about over the course of my life and actually written down and try to, you know, use as a touchstone and go back to. So I've been thinking about how do you, and I'm doing this with a good friend of mine who I've worked with over the years, how do you create a framework for helping people get to personal purpose, right? There are a million articles and books and things like that out there about what it means to live with purpose. And here are some questions to help you explore it, but nobody takes you through a process, right? You have to go to a therapist or a life coach or something along those lines. So how do you develop a framework for personal purpose? Um, and what are the what's the path to get there? Um, so that's what I'm thinking about and reading about and doing active work along the lines of right now. Um, you know, because I back to kind of our original conversation about the millennial generation, I think people are, are and in the wake of the pandemic, I think people are seeking this right now. You know, I think people are looking for a way to understand their sense of purpose. I think there's value for this in the context of an organization, right? I think you, if you help leaders consider individual purpose, they're going to be better leaders. They're going to be better leaders of a purpose-driven organization. And they're probably going to function better as a team. <laughs> you know, so that's what I'm thinking a lot about right now is how would you how would you do that? Um, one of my favorite stories um that Joey, my boss at Bright House, used to tell all the time was about um JFK visiting NASA before they put the man on the moon and he was you know visiting with the scientists and the engineers and talking to them about what they're doing and he stopped and talked with the janitor and he asked him what his job was and the janitor said to help put a man on the moon you know he understood like that he felt that I am connected to something larger than myself you know I am connected to something more than a mop and that gives you know, I think we all need that, right? That feeling of being connected to a purpose larger than ourselves. And we all play a role in it. And some people's roles are a little more glamorous and some people's roles are a little less glamorous, but, you know, we're all part of something bigger. Where do you get your information from? Like, where do, what do you read? What's your, what's your go-to in terms of content sources for folks out there? I like books. I, do you know, it's funny. I was just recently lamenting kind of, I still go to Bards and Noble and I still go to like, we have a great, great local bookshop here, but that's more for like um, novels and stuff like that. Uh, There's a Barnes and like Noble book. open in Asheville. There is. And it's <laughs> wow. a good, one. it's big. Okay. I mean, I'm still literally a card carrying member of Barnes and Noble. <laughs> do you, where else do you get your content? Like where do you get your news? Do you subscribe to any newsletters? Outside uh, of I the do culture edit? Just, uh, I love the culture ed- edit. I love the <laughs> you didn't have a choice on that. It uh, just came to you. You guys do a really good roundup. I, lo- I love what you guys have been putting together in there. Um, I love podcasts. Um, I love like the Huberman Lab is awesome. I also always listen to my good friend Alan Murray's podcast, um, Leadership Next, which is amazing. Um, I still religiously, you know, watch CNBC in the morning and read the journal um, because just kind of mass news. But yeah, those are those are my big news sources, I guess. Okay. Okay. I also like Barry Weiss's The Free Press. Dude, what podcasts are you guys into? Uh, so the one I've been listening to a lot lately is is the Think Fast Talk Talk Smart. It's a communications podcast out of Stanford, out of the Strategic Communications Business, like part of the business school. Um, it's really I, I like it. I've been listening to it 
multiple times a day. And the episodes are relatively short, so you can get through a lot of them quickly. The only thing is I'm starting uh-huh. to run out of podcasts. So, uh, send, send <laughs> Dangerous in. game. Because I listen to the Huberman Lab, but some of those are too... I have such bad ADHD that they're so long, he kind of loses me throughout. And so I jump around, but with... I like the shorter ones where I can get through a lot of interviews quickly uh, and take notes. Yes. So, yes, uh, I was just trying to remember the name. Of it. I'm with you. I'll listen to like sometimes when they're like two and a half, three hours long. I'll listen to like the first 45 minutes, and then if it's not something I'm too, too deep into, I'll be like, yeah, I'm good here. Um, the other one that I love, and I was trying to remember the name of it, is Michael Lewis's podcast. Michael Lewis is it's called Against the Rules. He's the guy that wrote. Um, uh, uh, liars poker is it liars poker but he wrote uh um Moneyball, mm, um the yeah. blind side uh he has a fantastic podcast that it's really kind of untold stories of heroes in some ways that would never make the news <laughs> yeah. uh and it's it's really fantastic i love him he's great yeah very cool. really good thinker too just interesting mind mm. thank you for joining us that was awesome and we will definitely talk again soon Yes, thank you so much. Let's definitely talk again soon, and I'll come interview you guys. Oh, that that sounds great. (laughs) All right.